Okay, this is chapter three, the second part, and we'll talk continue to talk about sales. As soon as it's moved. Okay, sell to sell, sell to environment interactions involves glycoproteins and proteins of the glycocalyx. These are somewhat of a name tag on your cell. It involves cell adhesion molecules and membrane receptors. It's not moving very fast, is it? Okay, pictures, there we go. Okay, I hope you just thought about that slide if it took that long. Okay, adhesion molecules anchor cells to the extracellular matrix or to other cells. Help Sue's cells move past each other and attract white blood cells into injured areas to bite germs and they stimulate synthesis or degradation of adhesive membrane junctions. They transmit signals, they cause cell migration, proliferation, specialization. Rose membrane receptors, these are for signaling. Uh, contact signaling the cell touching another cell may help it in, like, to know whether it belongs there or not. It's immune system. Then chemical signaling, things like neurotransmitters and hormones. And we also have alterations of the cell activity, such as enzymes and chemically gated ion channels. And ligand binding uh, gated channels activates a G protein, and we'll discuss that further later. The cytoplasm is located between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. It contains a cytosol, which is the watery stuff that makes up the cell, lots of solutes in it, sugar, salts, proteins, cytoplasmic organelles, which are the metabolic machinery of the cell, and inclusions. These are not actually living stuff, but little particles that are wrapped in wrappers glycogen, pigment, such as the melanin that gives your skin its color, fat droplets or lipid droplets, vacuoles, crystals. Okay, this one's an interesting slide. Cytoplasmic organelles, and since it's just a mixed match, one, we'll skip it. Okay, mitochondria. These are Double shelves, uh, I'll show you a picture of it. See, it got double wall, and then these little areas here they call cristae. And what they do is they burn cellular energy like fuel. For instance, glucose is broken down and burned by the mitochondria. Now, burning re refers to combining with oxygen. And they provide ATP, which is your charged battery. That's the energy from the burning of your fuel uh, is uh, basically for, to use to form ATP from ADP. And then you break it back down and release that energy to do anything you do. They also contain their own DNA and RNA. Interestingly enough, this DNA may have somewhat of an effect on our makeup and most of the mitochondrial DNA we're going to get will be from a maternal parent. Uh, the sperm has doesn't really come along with its own mitochondria. Okay, ribosomes are the side of protein synthesis. Now we have some that are free and just floating around in the cytosol, they synthesize soluble proteins. And then we have membrane bound ribosomes. These are going to be on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And they synthesize proteins that may be incorporated into membranes or exported from the cell. 
the endomembrane system is basically a whole system that stores, produces, and exports biological materials, degrades harmful things. And first we'll talk about our endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, a wavy, I'll look at the picture here, waves of membranes. If you were trying to create a model of a cell using a big glass bowl as your plasma membrane and jello as your cytosol, you could use very, very thin stringy taffy to make your smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you'd have to have little sprinkles from the candy store to go on it. And they are what makes the protein, cytoprotein synthesis. Um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is the part that does have the little buttons on them, like so your sprinkle candy. So they actually do make your proteins. And smooth endoplasmic reticulums, they have many enzyme functions, lipid and cholesterol metabolism, breakdown of glycogen, uh, detoxification of drugs, pesticides, synthesis of steroid-based hormones, in intestinal cells, absorption, synthesis, and transport of fats, and then in muscle cells, storage and release of calcium. The endoplasmic reticulum is a, just holds the calcium in a little uh, vat, basically, until you need to have a contraction. And we'll talk about how that works in chapter, I think it's not. The Golgi apparatus, you see here off of the endoplasmic reticulum, it's going to package and transport materials, and in this case, it's exporting them. So package and transport vessels. And uh, secretory vessels uh, can be made or put into these vesicles and spit out that way. There we go, secretion by exocytosis. Lysosomes are there. Now, we, when we talk about endocytosis, eating something. It's got to do something with it. And so it takes that little vesicle of the germs and it moves it over to a lysosome and fuses with it in enzymes and acid hydrolases inside these lysosomes digest bacteria, virus, toxin, fungus, anything that needs to be digested. Old organelles also, glycogen, if you need to break down glycogen to have the energy from it. And glycogen is the equivalent of starch in a plant, it's glycogen in an animal. Break down a bone to release calcium. And then old, injured, non useful tissue, which is called autolysis, such as you, when you were an embryo, you all had a tail, and most of you don't have one now, I hope. Peroxisomes, uh, these are membranous sacs that have oxidases and catalases, and they detoxify harmful stuff, such as hydrogen peroxide. It's very toxic to cells, and it is formed in cells, and it must be broken down. And when you pour hydrogen peroxide on a boo-boo, and it bubbles, it makes that glorious bubbly stuff, what you're seeing is oxygen bubbles. Does it kill germs? Probably. Is it good for tissue? No. It's okay for little surface injuries, just to clean them up a little bit, but you never pour this in a deep wound because it'll cause a lot more damage, hydrogen peroxide, it'll cause a lot more damage than it will help. Also, free radicals are chemicals that end up temporarily having unpaired electrons. Peroxisomes get rid of those. The cytoskeleton is a series of rods throughout. Cytosis and exocytosis, so microfilaments involved in change, shape of the cell. And this is showing 
blue is a stain where microfilaments show up in blue. Intermediate filaments uh, basically are they're like little ropes and they help hold the cell into shape. And these are purple stained. It's a cell, but all you see are the microfilaments. Microtubules are just what they sound like. They're little microscopic tubes. And this is interesting because of the gold are your microtubules. Now we have also motor molecules. And this is something like a little android out of a science fiction show because actually ATP causes the little molecule to stick this foot up, move it over here, and then that one, and you see them just walking along. They move things around in the cells so that you can move it uh, and move things in general. Now, centrosome uh, means cell center. It generates your microtubules, organizes the mitotic spindle, which we'll look at, and contains centrioles. And here we have centrioles, microtubules. Now, cellular extensions, in actual class, I can attach videos, but I, we can't look at a video of a cilia or of flagella uh, attached here because this program won't let me attach them. But cilia are short cellular appendages, such as in your trachea. It moves stuff out of your trachea so it won't get in your lungs. And the only flagellated cell in the human is a cell, is a tail of a sperm. Cilia, short, flagella, log. Other cellular extensions, we have uh, the, the villi, microvilli. So here's a little cell, and it's got villi. And then on the top of that, you have little microvilli that create a great area for absorption. The nucleus is the genetic blueprint for all cellular proteins. And they carry the signal to make all the proteins, and basically all of you, every nucleus in every cell of your body has the code to make all of you, theoretically. Both cells have one nucleus, they're uninucleate. They have no nucleus. A means without. Um, they have them when they're immature, but then they kick cells, bone destruction cells, and some liver cells are multinucleate. And here is your nucleus here. Nuclear envelope, which we saw a picture of right here, it's just the wrapper. And it has, that was quick, uh, pores in it. It has uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum with ribosomes. And the pores regulate transport of large molecules into and out of the nucleus. Nucleoli are a little dark area, it means little nucleus within the nucleus. And they're involved in ribosomal RNA synthesis, synthesis as well as ribosome subunit assembly. A chromatin are threads of DNA with histone proteins and RNA, and they are arranged in units called nucleosomes. And then they condense into bar-like bodies called chromosomes when the cells get ready to divide. And here you see this cell has got, it's already actually duplicated the DNA, and so we have sister chromatids. This chromatid and this chromatid are complementary of each other. Well, actually, we've already got the whole division, so they're exact copies. Now, the cell cycle, reproduction of the cell. Now, we're not talking about sexual reproduction. We're talking about somatic cell. It consists of interphase and then mitosis. So, 
most of the cell life cycle is in DNA. It's got to grow, grow, grow. It's got to double in size. And then your DNA replicates itself. And then we start to actually go through mitosis and cytokinesis. Okay, and this is just showing interface. Uh, not terribly interesting. Okay, now the DNA, it's a double helix. It's shaped like a ladder that's been twisted into, um, well, a helix. And it unwinds due to an enzyme called helicase. And it exposes chains, and they're not exact the same. They're complementary to each other. And each nucleotide serves as a template for building a new complementary strand. Now, DNA polymerase only works in one direction, and we have two DNA molecules formed from the original DNA molecule. Okay, this is this would be the original DNA. See the double twisted ladder. Now we have the bases are adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. You can remember A, T, C, G. And if you look over here, this is going to be your uh, DNA polymerase here. And it unzips this cell. And you have three nucleotides. And certain ones match with certain other ones. So this is a T and this is an A. So when this T here unzips, it's got to find an A to go. I got it backwards. This is supposed to be the A. And it's got to have a T, and so it will find it complementary sides. So each of these is a mirror image of the other. And once it's through, you have two complete new strands of DNA. Now, mitosis occurs in cells that are growing. It's there for tissue repair. Does not occur in the nervous system. Um, in the cells of the nervous system, like if you damage brain, it's damaged. Skeletal muscle, same thing. Cardiac muscle, as of now, that's the same thing. Every now and then a scientist comes up saying, aha, we saw cardiac muscle repair itself. But then it's disproven, so who knows. Okay, now, cell division. Uh, we have these four phases, prophase, metaphase anaphase and telophase, and then cytokinesis. Prophase, the chromosomes are starting to become visible, and mitotic spindles are starting to form. The nuclear envelope fragment, so it's no longer wrapped up like it was. And as you see, we already have replicated chromosomes because that happened during interphase. And here's your mitotic spindle. And what's going to happen is it's going to attach. It will separate to either side of the cell. And we'll just go ahead and look to the next phase. OK, now we have late prophase. We've already started this. This piece of the spindle is going to Whereas you're going to get this one's going to come up and attach to this chromatid. Now, next we have metaphase, meta for middle. All your chromatids are lined up right in the middle. And the point is, this is going to shrink, and this is going to shrink, ripping these chromatids apart. So as you go into um, anaphase, you see they have been ripped apart nicely. And they're heading this direction, because the point is we're going to make two different cells. Telophase, and this is an actual photomicrograph, you have got two independent nuclei, but the cell still has it completely divided there. And then cytokinesis, you actually have a cleavage furrow, which is a um, uh, division furrow. This is a nice picture of it. This is telophase. And, and look at it like a string. It's a protein string, I guess. It does kind of look like some kinds of cleavage. It gets tighter, tighter, and tighter, and tighter, and then it pops apart. You have two cells. 
just like a balloon, except the gene is a segment with a blueprint for one polypeptide or protein. Triplets of nucleotide bases are basically our genetic library because each triplet called a codon codes for an amino acid. So if you want a protein made of amino acid, one, six, two, three, eight, whatever, you're gonna have the triplets of uh, nucleotide bases lined up to pick those up. Now, RNA has, we have three types, messenger and RNA. The DNA code is gonna be copied off or transcribed onto the messenger RNA. It's gonna take instructions for building your protein up from the, the gene and the DNA out to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Now, ribosomal RNA is a part of the ribosome that helps translate that message into an actual protein. Transfer RNAs actually bind to amino acids uh, with bases of codons. So you've got a codon is three bases in a row, and it's going to actually pick up and put the amino acid in the right place. And the trans, uh, translation is actually starting the formation of the protein. And here we have a picture somewhat. You see with DNA, we copied both sides. With RNA, we only copy one side. And instead of a T, we have a U, so it's a little difference there, a uracil instead of a thymine. Well, this is our um, transcription, and it's just going to copy this little section however long it needs to copy off. The translation is converting the base sequence uh, into proteins. It's actually building of the protein. We also have extracellular materials that make up part of our body, bodily fluids, interstitial fluids, blood plasma, cerebrospinal fluid, cellular secretions such as intestinal and gastric juice, saliva, mucus, serous fluids, and the extracellular matrix, uh, protein, polysaccharides, and contact with cells. So there's a lot to you besides just cells. Now, Developmental aspects, all cells of the body contain the same DNA, but they're not all identical. There are triggers that turn on and off certain genes, most of which we don't know about, which cause cell differentiation. So your toe looks like a toe, and your nose looks like a nose. We eliminate old or aged cells through programmed cell death, which is called apoptosis and then they're phagocytized. Okay, theories of aging. Why do you get old? Recent researchers have come up with an idea that no one lives past 115. Um, most people don't live anywhere that long, and I'm not sure I would want to. Okay, the first theory is the wear and tear theory. Little chemical insults and free radicals add up, and you just finally wear out and die. And it may be right, it may not be right. The next one, immune system disorders. The older you get, you start getting more and more autoimmune disorders and you croak. The next, which a Nobel Prize was won for, and is considered the greatest thing, except for now there's evidence it's wrong. This is the genetic telomere theory. Now, a telomere, this is not a telomere, this is a bread bag. And on the end of the bread bag, we have a twist. Every time you open that bag of bread and take out some bread, close the twist tie. Well, a telomere is supposed to be un, uh, uh, DNA that doesn't code for anything that's on the end of each double helix. And every time that cell divides, they get a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter. And so eventually they get too short to replicate and you die. Largely on the first cloned mammal, Dolly the sheep, uh, who was named apparently after Dolly Parton, which is a little interesting.
but um, she died at a very young age, and they said, aha, the telomere, prove it. She was already old when she was born. Now, this theory has hold on, held on quite a while. Another issue, okay, cloning, what they do with cloning is they take a somatic cell, say a cell from an ear, a blood cell, any kind of cell that has living cell nucleus, so the DNA from it. And then they take an egg from a donor animal or human, or we haven't officially done cloning in humans yet. They take the, the egg, the unfertilized egg, and they remove that nucleus from that unfertilized egg and put in a somatic cell. And then they put it in the right uh, chemicals that cause growth and development. And uh, if they put it in the right environment, it acts as an embryo and grows into, if put, once it's put into a uterus, an adult animal. Now, this whole cloning thing has brought up the fact that there's more to it. Gregor Mendel came up with a great theory on how traits are inherited. But this was a smart little Lena. It's a cutting, champion cutting horse. Now, what a cutting horse is, they don't cut anything uh, with the scissors or anything. They have a group of cattle, and they pick one cow, you know, the rider does, and they have to separate that cow out of the group. And apparently, it's real easy to fall off of those horses. They did a world champion, great animal. Well, they decided they wanted more of him. And these are his clones. Now, look at them. Let's go back to the original. See the nice little blaze, no markings on his front legs, white in the back. Here we have white here, white here, different shaped face, different shaped face markings. Every one of these looks the same. Now, cost $150,000 to create one of these clones. Clones here. What ultimately happened to these clones? One of them died of cancer. Uh, four of them were sold as stallion, to be breeding stallions. And the most any of them brought was about $10,000. Only brought three thousand dollars, so a hundred fifty thousand dollars invested to three thousand dollars, and one didn't even make it. I don't know which one didn't make it. I was just looking at him because he was scrawny, but it could have been that one. I don't know. But anyway, it was not the best thing. And this is an extreme issue. Rainbow. She was a cat chosen for her unique color. This is her clone. Identical CC for carbon kitty. Absolutely identical DNA. Look at the difference in the pattern. The color the same. But they check the DNA. These are the same cat, but they're not. And uh, this brings into a study, uh, well, it shows that everything Gregor Mendel had to say wasn't absolutely correct, that there's something more. To what makes us us. It's environmental all the way into the intrauterine stage. And there's even some evidence uh, that some things like trauma, stress in your environment could cause your DNA to change a little bit the way it's expressed. This is called epigenetics. And it may go several generations along such as after a great famine uh, in, I think it was Ireland, the next generation of kids were smaller, and that lasted for several generations. Uh, so you know, the whole story is not out yet, but I think you're going to reproduce yourself by cloning. Uh, you might not get somebody as good looking as you are, but that's a study for another day, and I think this next slide is a white cat in a salt mine at high noon. And that's it for chapter three.